Hi, everyone. My name is Derek Slapp, state representative representing parts of West Hartford, uh, Avon, and Farmington. And welcome to the very latest uh, edition of Derek and the District. Um, and today we're going to be talking about something that I know a lot of you care a lot about, and that is governance oversight at the MDC. Um, I have heard uh, a lot um, about this uh, from constituents uh, for um, really more than a year now, and uh, it's something that is such a, an important issue that it was actually the uh, first uh, bill related to uh, governance at the MDC that was uh, passed uh, in the 2017 um, legislative session and the uh, first law uh, that was really enacted and became a public act. Uh, and it did uh, two things, and I'm going to describe them very quickly and then we'll get uh, right into it, uh, and I'll introduce you to to our two guests, uh, the state's um, consumer counsel, Ellen Katz, and the uh, very first uh, independent MDC consumer advocate, David Silverstone of West Hartford. Both of them actually are from West Hartford. Um, but first, what does this bill do? It establishes an independent MDC consumer advocate, and we'll get you know, uh, to talking more about that in just a moment. Uh, and it also eliminates so-called reserve payments. And this is something that um, West Hartford had to set aside about $2 million for when there was some concern not that it's completely gone, but that the city of, West, uh, city of Hartford might go bankrupt. And if that happened and uh, the city was not able to make its payment to the MDC, then the other member towns would have to cover Hartford's payment. So we got rid of that practice, and now um, any uh, public grants that would be going, state grants that would be going to a delinquent town um, would be garnished, would be held back. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we're protecting uh, West Hartford taxpayers uh, to the tune of about $2 million. So uh, that's a very uh, immediate thing uh, that's happened, and that's certainly good uh, for all taxpayers. But now uh, let's get to uh, our special guest. Um, and, you know, very exciting uh, because oftentimes I think uh, we pass legislation at the Capitol, and you say, how does this really impact my life? Um, this is a, an immediate uh, impact, and it's really, I think, going to help uh, governance, uh, transparency, and oversight at the MDC. So, uh, Ellen, uh, welcome to you. Thanks for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Oh. And congratulations on this very important legislation. Well, it was a real team effort, as we know. It Senator Bai was instrumental in this, mm -hmm. Representative David Barham uh, of Bloomfield, Representative Del Nicky. It was really mm -hmm. a good bipartisan mm -hmm. yeah. effort, too. Uh, and David, thank you for coming on. Thank you for me. having me, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. Um, Ellen, why don't we start with you, and, and um, if you can describe, um, in your view, why this bill and the creation of a consumer advocate, independent, um, sure. is so important. Right, right. Well, first of all, my office serves as the independent consumer advocate for what we call investor-owned utilities. Uh, and these are companies like Connecticut Water and Aquarian and Eversource. Um, and I think it's very important because utility customers um, are subject to a monopoly. You don't have any choice where you get your water from. And uh, I think it's important that they have their own independent voice in any um, proceedings with respect to their utility bills, especially with respect to water is one example. Um, and I think transparency and accountability is particularly important so that there is public trust in the utility. As I said, it's a monopoly. So you want to feel that you're getting a good rate, that your voice is being heard, and that um, you have a transparency into the process. And MDC mm -hmm. is not mm -hmm. one of the companies that is what we call an investor owned. It's a quasi public, which means it is not subject to regulation by the, uh, by the public utilities regulatory authority. It's sort of mm -hmm. a self governing mm -hmm. body, and it really falls upon the legislature to make tweaks to that system when there seems to be a problem. And I think in this case, we've been hearing in my office for several years, and, and before that, concerns from MDC consumers about costs and pricing, um, and recently there was concerns in the last uh, 18 months about um, the bottling plant and consumers feeling like they didn't have a way to express their voice with respect to how their water was being used. And so this process creates um, more oversight, more transparency for, in, for MDC. They're still not regulated by Pura, right. um, but because of David, I think consumers can feel comfortable that they're going to have a look into the books, how it's run, how decisions are made, and, and in fact, before final decisions are made, um, David's going to be able to be part of the process and say consumers are worried about this or that. And so it's a great development. Great. And David, excuse me, you bring a lot of experience uh, to this role. Can you uh, give us your resume in you know, 30 <laughs> seconds? If the 30 can. second version, sure. Uh, well, uh, back in the 70s, believe it or not, I uh, had Ellen's job, and I was the consumer counsel for the state of Connecticut, similar to Ellen's role. 
Uh, this is when I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't read it. Well, we, and we dealt with all the issues that she just identified. Right. And David's being modest. He was the first consumer right. advocate for the state of Connecticut, uh, so he blazed the path. So we got a good one here. We did. <laughs> we did. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then since, and then I left that in the late 70s, went into private practice, had many clients um, regarding utility issues, both municipal utilities, uh, people with problems with their utility, large consumers, small consumers. Uh, and then I ended up as uh, CEO of the Regional Water Authority, which serves the greater New Haven area with water. So I have insights into the water business. I retired from that several years ago. Uh, and so when this job came along, when I saw that you guys had created it, I said, gee, this is perfect. Um, for me, uh, blending that consumer advocacy experience with my experience in the water business, um, hoping I can bring uh, that perspective to the MDC deliberations. And uh, you started uh, officially on the job, what, just about a week ago? Right. January, Start, right? Officially started January 1st. The appointment was back in uh, early November. Yep. So I've spent the last couple months talking with consumers, meeting with some of the folks involved with the Save Our Water issue in Bloomfield, uh, reading... Um, if, you're, if you should have insomnia, you might want to read the charter for the MDC <laughs> and really understanding how it's set up and okay. how it functions. Uh, so that's been very important so, to, so I can hit the, what I hope to do is be able to hit the ground running. And so in your conversations, discussions with folks, including Save Our Water, which they, this group is, is amazing, right? These citizen activists, and I've spent a lot of time with them. All of us really have, right? right? Understanding um, what their concerns are and, and really a nonpartisan, you, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. Um, passion for all these folks. Um, but how would you describe the uh, public sentiment right now um, you know, surrounding the MDC? And I, maybe that's an unfair question, but I'll, I'll, I'll see what you could do with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, let's remember that there are something like uh, a million consumers or half, three quarters that's of right. a million consumers in the greater Hartford area. So th to think that I've spoken to each and every one of them would be incorrect. But the sentiment I'm getting is that um, it's not necessarily that the MDC is some evil empire. It's rather a lack of um, understanding of how it functions and a lack of, sometimes lack of appreciation by MDC as to why customers want to know about stuff. So let me just give you an example. Yeah. Um, every water utility in the state has to file with the Department of Public Health a water supply plan. And those water supply plans are incredibly detailed, including uh, where the valves are to serve Maple Avenue. I mean, very detailed stuff. Um, after 9-11, back in 2001, um, and previously water utilities had, had put this stuff on their websites. Uh, if they had websites, yep. or if you wanted to walk in and you wanted to see the, here, here's a copy of the plan. Right. Ask me any question you want. Well, 9-11 caused a, a, a proper concern that this information shouldn't be so readily available. Uh, there was the sabotage issue, how easy mm -hmm. it would be to contaminate a water supply, lots of discussion. Um, since 9-11, though, we've sort of come back and said, okay, there is some information that, we need to, that needs to be kept uh, on a confidential basis, but there's a lot of information that can be public. So one of the issues with Save Our Water was this bottling plant is using a whole lot of water how much water do we really have? Mm -hmm. Well, then you go to the water <coughs> supply plant to see how much water you really have, and the very parts of the water supply plant that describe how much water we have were the parts that were confidential. So you had people rightly saying, how much water do we really have? And then you had organizations like the MDC and other water companies saying, we're not, we have plenty of water, but we can't give you any detail. Right. Well, that's not gonna, that's not gonna create public trust. <laughs> You know, so you have to hit some happy medium. How much information do you provide? S keeping everybody safe, but providing enough information so that customers can make a determination, do we have enough water? Um, so that's the kind of thing, that's an issue that I'm sort of in the middle of already. Yep. And I think we're seeing some progress and I, that's something we have to work on to reach that balance between information necessary for consumers to make reasonable choices and reasonable statements and comments and advocacy to their representatives, and at the same time not provide information out in the public domain that uh, ought not be in the public domain. 
Yeah, you know, and, and I hear a lot from constituents as well, right, about, um, you, know, you know, frustrations. Part of it with um, access to information, right. I think, ex you mm -hmm. know, exactly as you said, but also just, you know, let's say pricing, for instance, mm -hmm. too. The bulk pricing, the idea that, you know, if you are a bottled water company, for instance, the more water that you use, the cheaper it gets. Mm -hmm. Where And people mm -hmm. say, well, wait a minute, this is a, um, you know, this is a, a resource that we should protect, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And then when we go into drought, Mm -hmm. Right, and mm -hmm. we are all asked consumers to cut back and save. Right. But right. you know, however many you know, millions of gallons right come out for the bottled water plant could keep flowing, and we truck it out of state. So those things, I think, are real frustration. Yeah. I know, I, that's something probably both of you have kind of yeah. well, conversations about, right? Uh, no, I just say, I mean, water is deeply personal. We find people um, because the waters of the state of Connecticut belong to the people of the state of Connecticut by law, and so there's a sense of. You know, electricity, you generate it, and natural gas, we get it from somewhere else. But water, it's our water, mm -hmm. and how are you using my water? And people feel that very strongly and viscerally, and um, it's totally understandable. And so, therefore, there's a little bit of, well, you're selling me my water, so I'm entitled to um, a good price and information and transparency. And I think that has led to um, a lot of these concerns that you articulated, both of you, so well. And I will say... This is an example of how citizen engagement can really make a difference because people say, oh, I have no voice in the world. But this was a, you know, a small core group of people. It wasn't hundreds, it was, but it was a, a very dedicated group of people who felt that um, MDC was not transparent enough, wasn't answering their questions. And, you know, they really, with the help of the legislators, obviously made a big difference. And so, you yep. know, I really can yep. commend citizens for engaging and continuing to engage. Yeah, anyone who wonders, you know, can you make a difference? Right. This is really evidence mm -hmm. that, that you can. I know you had something you wanted to add, too. I'm right? just going to add that, you know, so the, the issue about rate design, you know, who, how should rates be designed to maximize uh, economic efficiency and fairness and equity uh, and still allow the, the utility to recover its costs? That's a, that's a critical issue. So yeah. something like a declining block rate, which is what was originally proposed there, um, whether or not that makes sense really depends on getting, putting together a study, a cost of service, it's not anything unusual, cost of service study to figure out where the costs really are imposed on the system. So that's one of the things we're going to be looking at uh, with, with regard to MDC. When was the last time they did a cost of service study? Uh, what should it look like? How should how should we go about doing it? And I think that's going to provide some of the answers that people want. Okay, good. Because you know, people, uh, I think they see their bills, and they used to come what four times a year, and now yeah. they come every month, and they're higher uh -huh. too. So people are wondering sure. what's mm -hmm. what's going on, and right. they want answers. So um, it sounds like you'll be able to help. You know, not necessarily wave a magic wand and lower rates right away or anything like that, <laughs> yeah. but at least to address that, the concerns. I, I left. I left the magic wand in Ellen's office. Fair so. enough. Fair enough. <laughs> she um, gets to use it. I do want to address the the independence part of mm -hmm. it because there may be some people, rightfully so, who are uh, watching this and say, "Well, wait a minute. You know, are, are you really going to be independent?" And um, the way that we crafted the bill, I think ensures that right. you know you will be uh, an honest and independent broker. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, sure, because this was one of the things that was very important to you and, and other people who were involved. Um, the legislation sets up uh, a process whereby my office, the Office of Consumer Counsel, which has nothing to do with the MDC, um, is responsible for choosing um, the independent consumer advocate. And so we went through that process and which is how we arrived at uh, David. So it was my honor to select him. Um, and he is completely independent of MDC. Um, they do pay his bills, but it's purely as a pass-through. They actually go through my office. I see them as well. Um, and so I think that's a very important part of it because not only are you functioning independently, um, consumers can see that they're not your boss. Um, you don't really have a boss. You are in charge of uh, functioning in the way that you think is most important for the consumers and not for anybody else. Yeah, I mean, if, if, I, if I have a boss, it's the three quarters of a million consumers yeah, in the right. greater Hartford <laughs> area. Uh, I've been at this a while, and all I can tell you is uh, at this stage of my career, I, uh, the, my willingness not to be independent is zero. <laughs> I, that's a double negative, and I apologize no, for that. It actually made sense, though. Uh, <laughs> it worked. But uh, really, I, I see a, uh, an important role here as establishing the credibility of the office um, and establishing that this is an independent voice, that uh, I can work professionally with MDC people, not try to reinvent the wheel, 
but it really is meant to be an independent voice. Yeah, and I think that's why you're the perfect selection because you have uh, decades of experience, um, you have integrity, you've done this before, um, and so people should, uh, I hope, and I know they will, really have faith in, in, in you and in the office and, and mm -hmm. what we've um, established here. Um, so far, how has the relationship uh, been with the uh, MDC uh, in, in this position? I know it's early still, but how, how has it gone? Well, initially, we uh, had conversations even before we started the selection process with MDC. They were actually part of the legislative discussions with us. Um, certainly, you know, the legislators drove the bus, but, um, you know, I think there was a, they were supportive of the legislation. Mm -hmm. they, my interactions with them have been, you know, positive thus far. I think it's David is the one who's really getting in the trenches at this point. Yeah, so I've met with them several times. Uh, asked for a bunch of information. They've been forthcoming with that information. Uh, I really have no issues uh, at this point. One of, my, one of my roles, I think, is that if I do have issues, is not to just sit there and stew in my apartment, but to make, the, make Ellen and the legislators aware of the issues. But I have to say, so far, they've been completely professional, uh, provided the information I've asked for. Uh, we have another meeting for Monday yep. uh, where we're going to be talking about undertaking certain studies that I think are important. So I, I'm a, I go into these situations expecting uh, cooperation, and so far that expectation has been met. And you'll be doing some public reporting as well. Oh, right? yes. Uh, every quarter, uh, so that will start in April yep. and then um, October and so on, I have to give reports to um, the, the municipal officials, to Ellen, I have to have a series uh, of meetings, public meetings, and I'll be having those. We'll be scheduling those probably over the next month or so. Okay, and, and you know, before that or after, if people want to contact you directly, if you could give us your contact information, sure. and then we'll put it up on the screen so people okay. can so copy the, it Okay, uh, so the email address is icamdc17 at gmail.com. All right, say it one more time. Sure. ICAMDC17 at gmail.com. Okay. So I have to remember is independent consumer advocate MDC yep. 17 because I had to put a number in, otherwise I couldn't well, get that Well, and that's when we passed the, that's when we passed <laughs> right. the bill, right? That's right. Yeah. So 17 at gmail.com. That's the best way of getting a hold of me. Uh, I also have a phone number, uh, that de that, uh, a separate phone dedicated to this and I have to look at my cheat sheet. Okay. That number is 860-471-4961. Okay, and if, you, if neither of those are attractive to you, you can mail to me at um, I, uh, Independent Consumer Advocate, 1022 Boulevard, Suite 308, West Hartford, 06119. Perfect. So I just set those up, and that's why I need my sheet. No, understandable. <laughs> Ellen, any last words that you want to offer here on this new position and uh, your, your vision for how it's going to work? Oh, uh, we're very excited about it. And just to let you know, the information, uh, contact information is also on our website, Office of Consumer Council. Um, I think it's going to be great. Uh, it's been wonderful working with David thus far. He's got incredible credentials, and I know his sense of independence is what was really most impressive to us, and I think consumers are really going to enjoy working with him. Great. Thank you both, David, Ellen. Thank you so much thank for spending thank you. some time with us and helping to uh, educate the public about this important new piece of legislation. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with a local insurance company that's really going above and beyond in helping our community. All right, and welcome back to a segment that uh, I call Slap Salutes. And it's just kind of a fun way to uh, highlight local businesses or uh, community members who are really going above and beyond in uh, helping the community. And uh, we have a great guest uh, today who's doing just that with his uh, family-owned, third-generation local insurance company, Ryan uh, Keating, uh, with, and I want to make sure I get the name right, Keating uh, Agency Insurance. Is that right, Ryan? Yes. Yep. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming on spending some time. Uh, this morning. Um, you know, actually, people will be watching this uh, at 9.30 uh, at night. That's when it airs live uh, all through the month of, of February, and they can watch it online um, as well. Um, but uh, one of the reasons I asked you to, you know, to come on was to talk about uh, all the great philanthropic work uh, that the Keating um, Insurance Agency is doing. I mean, it's one thing to, to sell insurance, and you guys are doing a great job with that. It sounds like you're expanding as well, and we, we could talk more about that. Um, but you have, it, it seems like a real core uh, value of also uh, really contributing and giving back to the community, right? Absolutely. Um, from when my grandfather started the company, 
he was always a big education believer, former military veteran, and you know, he's seen a lot of things that people need support. And when you are successful and you're in a community like West Hartford, being able to support others is a core value of ours. Yeah, so can you, um, you know, tick off some of the, some of the uh, organizations or causes that, um, that your uh, company's involved in? So some of the things, this past year we uh, helped put together Backpack Bash and most recently just did a winter warming drive that we partnered with about nine other businesses in the greater Hartford area, mostly in West Hartford. Uh, the Backpack Bash brought together over 150 backpacks for the town that cares and they distributed over almost 800 backpacks. Wow. Which is pretty surprising. You know, West Hartford people think, you know, everyone has a nice life or this or that. Yep. And 800 backpacks is, I think, almost 25, 30 percent of the students in the public schools. Right. So, eight, yeah, 800 backpacks filled with school supplies, right? No, they weren't. So, this, um, because each student they oh, get has a different yeah. requirements. I, I don't gotcha. have children yet, but I think you. I do. I have, I have yeah. three. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, I, I haven't gone down that road yet, but. It just, it was a great to be a part of. We had a high school band from Hall, uh, Band 2, okay. that performed at the Backpack Bash. I remember stopping by and it was amazing, just the energy. This was at the Noah Webster House, yep. right? And it was, what was it? Uh, it was in the fall, am I right? Uh, right before school, so yeah. Yeah. Mid, late summer. Okay. Yeah. And you had, uh, what did you say, about 800 total? And these go we, to? We, we raised 150. Yep. The Town That Cares itself gave what, dispersed about 800 backpacks. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, and you're going to be doing that again uh, this next year? Yes. Yeah, the right. second annual one, we'll be actually sourcing sponsors for that this coming year and, and hopefully extend outside of West Hartford as well and you know, get over a thousand backpacks just from one drive would be great. That's fantastic. And the, uh, the War Chief Council is another thing that you are involved in? So the War Chief Council is a newer group that started in the last few years and that combines it's a booster club for Hall and Conard Athletics and they do some of the things. Um, there's a video program that all the high schools have now, so they, they're able to broadcast and show okay. the high school sports live, and it might actually run through the West Harvard Public Television as yeah. well. I'm not 100% sure on that. Great. But, so you're involved with, um, with, both of the, with both of the schools, both of the high schools. Yeah. Um, and then there's a, you were telling me before about a team, team GOAT. Do you want to uh, kind of explain yeah, to so, folks so, what that is? So Team GOAT has been, uh, our, our neighbor of ours, and Derek actually lives next door to my parents, uh, the Philippons, Ray and Lisa, lost uh, their son in Iraq. And about a decade ago, this actually was a 10-year anniversary, Team Goat was started as a remembrance lacrosse tournament for Larry. And my father, he played the cross, my brother played the cross, and my brother played, and we've been a supporter of that over the last 10 years as friends. And Larry used to babysit my brother, sister, and I growing up too. So it means a lot to my family, the town, and especially the Philpops. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great a great thing to do, and um, you know, for the community to come together and uh, you know year after year to make sure that um, you know that we don't forget, right? So That's yeah. Um, so you know, kind of speaking broadly, um, if you can describe kind of what what role. You know, philanthropy and the idea of really giving back plays um, in your your company, your you know, in your, your family's business, and kind of how that's been passed on from generation to generation. That's kind of what's uh, one of the things that's very inspiring to me. I mean, knowing you and your family, you know, it's the little that I do, but still be, being aware of all the great things that you do in the community. And I see you out on Facebook, and I see you really trying to connect people too. Uh, so personally, actually connecting is one of my focuses. Um, I actually have been working with a coach lately. And that's one of my top, you know, to bring people together and to connect people. And through philanthropy, that is probably one of the best ways to do it. I also feel as a young professional, you know, we don't have the monetary means per se as a, mm -hmm. someone younger starting their career. So the best way to give back is through your time and actually getting firsthand experiences. And I've kind of had that when I lived in Texas, I was very involved in a lot of nonprofit work. Um, San Diego, I lived there for a little while. And that was just a way also to meet people. Yep. Um, and doing different events and being able to have a business behind me. Um, it, it provides a bit more of a stepping ground, but it's also something that, you know, we have to give back. It's, it's a way of life. Um, you know, sometimes we've had hardships ourselves over the last few years with how the industry's changed, so we might not be able to do as much as we can. Sure. Uh, but having been home, I've been able to find different ways to make an impact, and it's exciting.
Yeah, and you know, you mentioned that you were in Texas and San Diego, and so and now you move back to Connecticut. And of course, on a, a macro level, we need a lot more of that, right? We need young folks, talented folks like yourself, um, either staying in Connecticut or moving back to Connecticut. Um, so one, glad to have you, and that's I'm just saying that from you yeah. know from a um, public policy uh, standpoint. Um, but uh, what do you think, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but what do you think Connecticut needs to do to attract more people like yourself? Uh, ironically, I just asked um, Oz the other day this. I saw, mm -hmm. I met him, he's doing a governor run. Yep. And he said jobs, and I, I agree with that, and I personally feel energy. Um, living in Dallas, the energy there was growing. You see cranes everywhere, you have growth. Um, Connecticut, unfortunately, and talking to some of my friends, we have a... It can almost say a pride problem. People, you know, you, you go, oh, I'm from Connecticut. Or people mm -hmm. aren't always proud to say that, and it's interesting, uh, especially having gone nationwide and met a lot of different people and lived in different places. So that's something that, you know, needs to change. And That we should take, you say, more pride in, in where we live? Is that where you live, yeah, yeah. being from Connecticut. Yep. Or, and, and part of it happens, I think, too, is there's the prestigious element, oh, Connecticut is a rich state. Mm -hmm. But... We're not overly, there's, there's wealth, there's old money, but there's a lot of newer money and people that are, have created something too through the last few years and people get lost in that mix. Yeah, and how do you compare our, um, our community, West Hartford, with uh, some of the other places you've lived in, whether it be San Diego or, um, you know, in, uh, was it Dallas? Dallas, yes. or, Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we're much smaller than those large metropolitan areas, but, um, you know, for people who haven't lived outside of the state, I think you're right that we can say, gosh, you know, con you know Connecticut or, or West Hartford, we have all these issues or challenges, but um, we're also pretty, we can be a pretty great place to live. Too. <clears throat> well, I mean, part of why I came back was I had an amazing childhood here. Uh, West Hartford offers a lot for children, and there is a bit of a, a bubble, though, from that after college years until you really start to, you know, want to settle down or have a family or you know, the West right. Hartford Center has grown so much with blue back, and that is attractive, but it's also expensive. Right. You know, if you're making an entry-level wage at a job, and you can't be going out to dine in West Hartford three days a week, four days a week, as much as you want to. Sure, or, sure. Um, and that's a lot of the lifestyles, though, that the younger professional crowd likes. Right. Um, there have been a lot of things. Uh, in this past year, we started the Future Leaders of West Hartford. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a group of founding leaders, and... We have a great board that's helped put something together that hopefully is going to make a long-lasting impact for the town and have people coming through the high schools realizing there's a group for them to meet other like-minded people. Great. Well, I know I mean, we're, we're really um, grateful as a community to have um, to you and your family for being here, for you coming back and to having, uh, you know, the Keating Insurance Agency and, and um, really, you know, the great philanthropic uh, spirit um, uh, that you uh, that you have, but then you kind of send the ripples out into the community. So, um, anything that I didn't ask you about um, about the agency or what's going on that you want to share with folks? Uh, it's exciting at the agency. So, being third generation, uh, my father and I work together. My sister's been getting involved, and we look forward to growing into our 50th anniversary. Actually, it's 2019. Wow! Congratulations! So, so we'll be building up to that this year, and so with that, we kind of want to gear some more social media yeah absolutely and, and marketing towards that uh, I mean, social media is a great way to get a name out and it's fairly inexpensive so yep you know it just takes the time well congratulations and look forward to celebrating that with you absolutely thank you so uh, that's going to do it for this edition of Derek in the district I do want to make sure I put up my contact information so if you have a concern uh, you know an issue you want to share your priorities with me for the legislative session anything you need any way I can be of assistance uh, my contact information um, is on the screen uh, derek.slap at cga.ct.gov you can also give me a call or look me up on Facebook thanks so much for spending this half an hour with me and I'll uh, see you again very soon. So long.